Hi everyone, welcome to another special All Access for Film Music Media's uh, Midsummer Music Matinee. I'm here with the entire team of Voodoo Highway Music Group. Uh, we got uh, James Chapel, we got Graham Cornies, we got Brian Pickett, and they've worked on a ton of amazing projects. Uh, Daniel's Tiger, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Paw Patrol, Total Drama Rama, Lucas Spider, The Coogan Evolutions, really focusing on kind of uh, young, young preschool entertainment and uh, children's entertainment, and we're gonna dig into everything that comes to as working as a music team and and their process so hey guys welcome and thank you so much for joining me thanks for having us that's great so yeah so let's start off I, I kind of i love to always find out everyone's origin stories so i mean i'm sure each of you came from different backgrounds so i'm curious or if, i don't know if you guys all met very early but t talk us you can go you know one at a time we can start maybe with brian like kind of what was your um when did music kind of enter your life and how did it turn into a career Sure. I, I, uh, I was a band nerd in high school, so I had entered my life probably around, gosh, maybe 10 years old, and I just started playing the piano and all that. And uh, in high school, I started playing music, and I just wanted to be a rock star. And I uh, learned music, music production in college. Uh, that led to a job working in a recording studio, and I saw all these composers coming in to record their uh, we were a jingle studio mostly, or a commercial music. We didn't do a lot of jingles, but it was people recording, you know, big commercial music for advertising. And uh, they'd be bringing these orchestras in, and these composers just seemed to have the greatest life. Uh, so I wanted to be uh, one. And so I contacted my good friend James Chapel and said, let's start a little writing collective. We called it a music house back then. I think that's what they called it. And, uh, and his dad lent us some money. and. Uh, we rented an office and we were only 21, 22 years old at the time. So. Oh, wow. That's and that fun. was 22 years ago now. Yeah. Wow. Like, I had hair when we started. Me too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah. This is the uniform now for Voodoo Highway. Yeah. Um, so the, the other thing I wanted to point out too, just to add on to piggyback on to Brian's uh, story there is that uh, we met, we actually graduated from the same college course called Music Industry Arts out of Fanshawe College in London, Ontario. And London, Ontario is kind of the nexus point for all of Voodoo Highway because that's where I'm from originally. Uh, and that's where I met Graham in high school, actually. We oh, played wow. so in a band. Oh, you guys go way back. Wow. We yeah. go way back, like teenagers. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so, uh, and then Brian moved to London to go to Fanshawe. So London, Ontario, Canada is kind of the starting point of this whole company. Um, mm. Myself, actually, I, I started uh, music lessons when I was three and I absolutely hated it. I played the organ, <laughs> the electronic organ um, through Yamaha Music School. Wow. And I hated it till I was about 11 years old when I got really good at it. And then when you get good at something, it's like super fun. So right. <laughs> that from that from that point on, it just all really clicked. And I uh, late in high school, I knew about the MIA program in London and knew that that's where I wanted to go and do that. And then fortunately, uh, Brian called me as soon as I moved to Toronto, uh, talking about starting a music house. So it was just kind of one thing led into the other. And then a few years later, when we needed some help, I knew the perfect person to call. Nice. <laughs> Graham, so Graham, uh, <laughs> talk to us about your kind of origin. When did music, get, before you kind of joined this group, was, was music in your life early in childhood? And did it push you towards that career? Or did they pull you, know, you into this career? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I wanted to be uh, uh, a visual artist when I was a, when I was really young, and my parents tricked me into um, going to this um, three-day audition for a publicly funded art school. If you can believe such a nice thing existed, uh, <laughs> but I didn't realize I was going to an audition. They just told me that I was going to play games at another school for a few days, and that's when I first actually even heard myself sing. They had me, you know, sing oh, wow. like a little star or or something like that, and. Um, I remember thinking that was like one of the first times I'd, I'd heard myself sing. And I think, you know, for the most part, they uh, were just looking for people that were enthusiastic about each aspect of the arts. You know, will you participate in dance class and drama class wholeheartedly and get into it? And considering I thought I was at a, uh, a another school to play games for a few days, it was easy to get into it. Um, yeah. So, you know. You know, that's kind of how it started, um, you know, me kind of going on a, a path where I was surrounded by adults who, um, you know, took the art seriously and encouraged me towards it and all that. And a few years later, my mom actually started a, a career in um, harp. So I watched her, um, you know, play events and make albums of her own and that sort of thing. So I kind of got a behind the scenes look at um, making albums early on. 
And by the time I was a teenager, I started saving my summer job money to uh, to make albums of my own because I'd seen, you know, the behind the scenes. And I was like, I think I could do this sort of thing. Um, and that's how I headhunted James. I wouldn't leave this guy alone until. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to play in his it. band at first. <laughs> I was avoiding him and stuff. And I, we joke true. sometimes, imagine how different the world would be, like less Paw Patrol music, you know? If, yeah. If I hadn't joined his band or whatever. Different so, anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they would have found another talented composer, but uh, we're, we're pretty lucky we got to be a part of it. And, um, you know, I was lucky that we got to, um, uh, that James said, yeah, eventually. And uh, I was persistent enough. And uh, eventually yeah. he came out and we, we ended up spending a lot of that summer driving around in his car and listening to mixes from the studio and finessing the tracks together and all that stuff. We had a lot of fun doing it. And it wasn't the last personal project that we played in before we joined forces, but um, I eventually... You know, I've been playing in bands from pretty much grade seven onwards through university. And then um, I went to university for uh, for music as well. Uh, and then partway through that, uh, I went into business with a, a different partner uh, a couple of years into that. These guys needed help. I, you know, it just seemed like an obvious fit. Uh, and I jumped ship to join these guys. And um, yeah, the rest is history sort of thing. Wow. Um, and it was, you know, it was an amazing move in that, you um, you know, leaving, uh, leaving school at the time was kind of a hard choice to make because, but at the same time, it was like, this is the exact opportunity that I'd be hoping for once I'm on the other side of school. So, you know, I finished one course at a time, that sort of thing. Um, and you know, until I was absolutely wrapped up, but some, you know, I was just in that mode mindset of like opportunity doesn't always knock twice, you know? So, um, yeah, dive, yeah. dive right in and, and finish the schooling as I can. And, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad it all came together the way that it did. Yeah. We're glad too. This is an opportunity. <laughs> that's amazing, and it's just it's so interesting. I mean, it, that story reminds me. I'm not a composer, but I mean, I graduated film school with all my friends, and we kind of all moved out to LA at the same time, and wow. we all lived together. But you know, of course, we all went our separate paths. You know, my, one of my best friends is in live action. I'm in animation, so we're not a, a team or a company or together. So I'm curious, why at that point did you want to start a music team? Was a uh, did any of you were like, oh, I want to, you know, because it, when you think of a composer, you think of the the, the path usually going you know, either school or you get a mentorship under a, a bigger name, work on a music team, then become your solo artist and start working that way. But you guys stuck together as a team and and kind of uh, held together. So I'm curious why at that early on in your age, did you want to start this company? Why did it seem like a good idea? And of course, keeping it in Toronto and keeping it in Canada, whereas you think, I think a lot of people are like, you know, you have to flock to LA to, to make it, but you guys clearly... I yeah, you know. I, thought, I thought that that was the all roads led to L.A. Uh, if you wanted to have this career eventually. Uh, and yeah, we were very lucky with our timing, though, because we mm -hmm. started the company in 2000. And right at that time, productions were flooding Toronto. Uh, and that was around the time. I know it was a little bit before that, but they started calling it Hollywood North. And there was just an influx of work and projects and everything going on so that even the crumbs that fell off the table, there was still enough crumbs to feed us. Uh, yeah. so it was just sort of being in the right place at the right time. And then, uh, it wasn't too long after that animation really started to take off in Toronto as well. And we just were in, uh, with the right people at the right time. Mm -hmm. And uh, as to why we didn't do it, um, alone, I think we were all, yeah. I can speak for myself. I was so young that I didn't have confidence to ever even think about doing it by myself. And I think I did approach a few composers as an assistant maybe. And I got the feeling like I didn't have necessarily, I did, like no one would hire me as a composer. So yes, maybe, You're some, lost. yeah, maybe someone to clean the toilets at their, uh, you know, their place. But uh, I wanted to, uh, yeah, I just wanted to jump into it. And we also, we also started as a commercial, like uh, we, I think our in, initial in, interest was to get into advertising and maybe some indie movies, whatever we could get our hands on. So at that time, youth, especially writing groups of youthful people, um, we're kind of in demand in Toronto, uh, you know, for among advertisers. So I thought we were a pretty hip bunch. And uh, yeah, I still then. am. I don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, uh, well, uh, you know, we did all the PlayStation advertising in Canada for uh, six years or something like that. But, you know, wow. that's the first meeting, the first people that would take the trust, trust a bunch of early 20s guys or whatever. So yeah, talk about another those, aspect those... Oh, yeah, to sorry, go working ahead, together. Sorry, there's just another aspect about working together that I think is really important, especially for any young composer that's just starting out and thinking about maybe being part of a team. The, there's so many benefits, right? Like the main one 
that I find is I always say we're kind of like the Avengers. Although lately <laughs> I've been saying we're more like the Ninja Turtles or something. But point being, we all have our own sort of, uh, we're, all, we're all good at all aspects of, of composing, but we all sort of have our niche thing that we are particularly strong at. Sure. Uh, yeah. And that, especially early on, was very useful because it allowed us to do so much more variety of projects and take on more work than we could if we were solo. Uh, and also to learn and be inspired from each other. Like I've learned so much about the aspects of, of composing that maybe I was a little bit weaker at from these two guys. Uh, and so it's just really good to be part of a team so that you all sort of have your own kind of talents and things that you can bring to the table. Yeah, Absolutely. you know, just to piggyback on what James is saying too, is that, uh, you know, not only do you learn from each other and have help, like what I love about this scenario is that it kind of is like a forever musical art incubator, <laughs> you know, like yeah, we're all teaching yeah. each other um, as we go continuously. And I think we've all become better writers by listening to each other write, because a lot of time we're trying to crack the same brief, you know, trying to crack the code of the same brief. And whoever gets it, you know, then we go, ah, that was the answer. And we, you know, we, we learn to... Uh, Kind of use some of those tricks in our bag of tricks uh, for the next time. Um, but the other the other part about it for young composers, I think like us having the courage to do it early, uh, there's never a better time to do it than when yeah. you're like really young because you know when you're fresh of being a student, you're like used to being poor and you're used right. to like you know you, you don't have any of the um, the adult trappings of like a mortgage or like you know uh, um, you know, or expensive stuff relating to having kids and all that stuff. You know, if you yeah. are doing it when you're really young, it's, uh, you know, great time uh, to take chances. it's a great time to take chances. And, well, and, and it and gives you the chance to grow, to grow together as well. Like, that's the other yeah. thing. We all got better together uh, yeah. over time. And so, uh, you know, that's another reason to get uh, get together when you're younger, if you can. I yeah, we're, love, we've been doing uh, it 22 years now and I say this yeah. all the time too like we always complete each other's musical sentences like uh Graham was just mentioning sometimes we'll we'll all three of us will pitch on a new show or do a pitch or read a brief and do something and what's been happening lately is we're almost scoring it all like I, we're hitting all the same moments uh in very similar ways it's actually been humorous sometimes <laughs> like how like we, com we, yeah it is a little creepy like uh, like we're all in each other's heads and I'll say definitely I have these guys voices in my head like when I'm composing often uh, like in a good way not in a critical way like just oh right. what would Graham do here what would Brian think of this or whatever so it's been very yeah, handy right. I'm, I'm very thankful that we've had each other as a group all this time yeah we built a bit of a musical hive mind <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, I mean too much over the years for sure it's i mean everything is better together i mean I, no one wants to be alone trap i mean i mean so maybe some people do i mean some people like be reflective and but to have a team and like that so i'm curious though how did you, you talk about how playstation was kind of your first big thing so i'm curious how do you even break into that world of like okay we're gonna do advertising and then how do you secure clients like that and then when did you branch into kind of narrative uh storytelling and outside of animation I can answer this one. It's like a, it's funny. It's like a, it's like a wacky path, of water following in the sand to the, uh, <laughs> to the ocean. Because um, yeah, we were doing advertising, and one of the directors on a commercial we did. And well, first off, we got our, we actually got our first advertising gig through a senior composer who was like uh, in his forties, late forties at the time, and mm -hmm. he was like, I got these Samsung ads, and I think I'd be cool. You guys seem cool. Why don't you try try it for? It? Then they worked out. They liked what we did, and and they're our first reel in animation. So then, or sorry, advertising, and then that was easy to get a couple more advertising gigs. But um, yeah, one of the directors of one of the ads said to us, oh, "I'm shooting this documentary on uh, for National Geographic. Why don't you guys try to write some music for it?" So we wrote some music for it, and another producer on there happened to co-own Cookie Jar, uh, which became I think they got bought up by Nell Bennett. And he said, do you guys want to uh, try demoing for one, some, of, some of our shows, some of our animated shows? And we had never done animation. Well, we were starting to get into animation from another path. But it's funny how that works. You know, it's just yeah. the people you meet. And if you make a good impression and you're laid back and seem to do a good job of writing the music or are easy to work with, then, um, yeah, then your career will keep traveling through the sand in different directions. Yeah, it's about building yeah, I mean, those relationships. If you're a young composer, I think uh, you kind of want to uh, 
follow whatever trail of breadcrumbs is kind of in front of you. Like I think having like a narrow scoped goal might work against you because, you know, at mm. first we kind of thought that we wanted to, uh, you know, maybe do movies, get into like adult oriented kind of action, that sort of thing. You know, we did commercials for a while. We did reality TV for a while. Uh, one of our first, um, uh, one of our first animated shows was a mock reality TV show, which we were kind of perfect for as guys who were doing a lot of reality TV. It was a chance for us to spoof that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I think while we may have intended to go in one direction, us finding a home in, in children's television was just, you know, the trail that we ended up uh, following over, over a long period of time. And I don't think we could have planned to end up in, you know, video games, for, for example, or uh, right. blockbuster yeah. films, for example. We just, you know, those set of relationships that were around us that we kept on, um, you know, the people we kept on working with that were provided with different opportunities. We couldn't have planned to be where we are. We kind of just had to take each opportunity as it came, like Brian was saying. Yeah, yeah. We were yeah. also lucky enough that uh, Total Drama, which is the reality-based cartoon, the, which was the first one that we actually landed, ended up being a massive hit, which again is sort of like winning the lottery. Oh. Like it was just yeah. total luck, but that opened up the door for us to audition for more things. And it's just sort of snowballed from there. Uh, so yeah, just, I, I like what these guys were saying about following the breadcrumbs or how the, how the water gets to the ocean. Like you never know, just sort of take the opportunity opportunities as they come and just have faith that you'll land somewhere that's comfortable and good. So I think we did. We and I, and I've heard, I've heard from a lot of composers. I mean, and it is a path, not just for composers, but directors come from commercials. I mean, I was just, you know, like somebody like Gore Verbinski did the Budweiser Frogs commercial or, you know, but then you have composers like John Powell who started off in commercials. And I know Michael Levine worked on the Kit Kat jingle and stuff like that. So I'm curious, and but everyone said that commercials and advertising was like a serious boot camp to kind of like yeah. really learn everything. And because you're, you're working with demanding clients, you have a very short amount of time and it has to hit certain points. So I'm curious, what were kind of the core lessons that each of you kind of took away from writing in, in advertising? that kind of you still maybe implement today. <laughs> well, one thing, I, one thing I like about it and still like about it is that every time you write uh, in advertising, you're usually writing against some of the best writers in town. So yeah. it's like kind of like, it's a chance to play the game of like, uh, you know, throwing your hat in the ring and trying to, you know, uh, to, to win it, right? And uh, so I feel like it's a good exercise. Uh, and also it teaches you, it's that pressure cooker challenge of needing to write on a clock, on the clock. And that's not going away in this yeah. business. <laughs> no matter where, where it is you end up, you're going to need to be able to write in the pressure cooker challenge sort of thing. So I think those two things are, are things that I like about it. The last thing I think I'd say is that um, the styles are all over the map. One, yeah. one week you're going to be writing for this demographic. The next week you're going to be writing for another, this demographic. And, you know, uh, unless the people who are calling you are calling you to do something ultra specific. Like if you're writing a lot of ads, you're going to be writing for a lot of different demographics and you're going to try and get in the mindset of like, well, this isn't my barometer of cool necessarily, but what's really cool to seven, eight year olds who, who like this type of thing, you know, like you, you know, you need to start getting in that mindset and trying to write towards other people's barometers of cool or great. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you're going to kind of always be doing that with clients, right? It's like, you're not yeah. writing for self-expression. You're writing to complete their bit of craftsmanship, you know, their, uh, the world that they've created already. So anyways, I feel like, yeah, ads do those three things really well. <laughs> they, add that, uh, they build an armor on you. So you get kind of used to throwing, you know, 24 hours of work in the garbage. Yeah. And, uh, you're just, you know, not seeing, you know, you learn to let go of things really quick. And right. See it is you got to take the positives, right? That was a great learning experience. I pushed, I learned how to do this on that track. And um, the stiff upper lip, right? Yeah, totally. You need it. Reject rejection is such a big part of the entire business. And that yeah. was that's one downside about we were talking earlier about starting young and starting as a group young. I think it was tougher for us to take negative feedback when, when we were young. I think sure, egos yeah. are a little bigger, which is totally natural and normal. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to now where our egos have been completely beaten down and uh, destroyed <laughs> over the years. Um, but you know what? It's it's actually, I, I think it's actually a really good thing to get your, uh, Brian's right, like get your skin thick as quick as you can. It's nothing yep. personal, right? And I, I've actually found nine times out of 10, eight times out of 10, the feedback that I get from a director or producer, they're totally right. And it actually makes my 
product better or I learn something from it. There's no, there's uh, every single project, every ad we ever worked on, everything we've ever done, we've always uh, taken away something positive from it. Even if it didn't end well, you always learn something or learn a new technique or have a new track to add to your library or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. that's sort of how I'd frame that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with that completely, especially from my side. It's, it was interesting because like, yeah, after you, you grad, you're, when you're in, in your school or in your small town, you're kind of in a little bubble. And I remember when we first moved to LA, we're all, we're going to be filmmakers and we're all going to direct films. And you know, Facebook had fan pages starting off. We had a director, you have your name there. And then, you know, it's like, no, you, you, and you're talking about, you know, um, the, the scope, Graham, you're talking about not having a narrow scope, but yeah, keeping that wide scope open because you have no idea the opportunities that are going to land and following those breadcrumbs right. and be like, oh, this is what I can contribute and what I'm good at. And you find out how you work with people and then you'll take you in a path that you never even imagined. And now I'm working in animation and I never, I couldn't even draw a stick figure, but now I'm like, you know, working at Cartoon Network Studios and it's just like, what? <laughs> like, you know, so. I'm yeah. curious about that path. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's. So that's why I always tell people, it's like, don't go out with like, a, I'm only going to be this. I'm only do yeah. editing. I'm only going to do directing. I'm only going to do these kind of projects because you have no idea. Because the, And also the industry is just changing every freaking day. You know, it's just Absolutely. like always changing. Um, it always prepares you. And, you know, even like uh, even doing other arts that only seem peripherally related, like, you know, we we have voiceover actors coming in here for animation all the time. You know, yeah. I, I've. I've done a lot of uh, voiceover auditions. And again, same sort of thing where you like, uh, you know, it's, there's like a high failure rate. You know, you get one big ad every once in a while or you get a cool role here and there, but it's actually good for you to just experience the failure over and over again, <laughs> just to yeah. do what we were talking about before, the stiff upper lip, the thick skin, recognizing that it's not personal. And it's just, yeah. um, you know, if I'm right for it, they'll, they'll cast me. If I'm not right for it, then, um, you know, something else. Next week's a new week, you know, that's auditioning. Auditioning for ads is very similar to auditioning as an actor because you might get one in 10. If you're lucky, that's actually a pretty good match. That'd be a pretty and, good ratio. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Then, Same with and shows, then, I'd say, like pitching for shows. Yeah. Like, one in 10. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, so I've, I know it sounds cheesy, but I've said for a while that uh, failure is almost more important than success in this industry because failure has prepared me. Failure is where I learned. Failure is where I learned uh, how to appreciate the success and how yeah. uh, maybe rare it is or special it is when something goes our way. Uh, so yeah, failure isn't a, isn't a bad thing at all. I try to frame it as almost the most important positive aspect of this whole career. Absolutely. Yeah. You can start off beating yourself up a lot. And I know I did like, oh, you go home and you just, you know, you just hate yourself. Like, oh, no, yeah. no. But then you realize it's just like, no, that's part of it. And you talk to other people and it's like, oh, they're going through it too. And it's, and yeah. it's yeah it's just you're all everyone's just trying to make the best and you know whatever you're making you know everyone's on the same goal sometimes it just works in different ways but yeah. um I, i'm curious as as a as a team as a trio what is your kind of collaborative process like you know i've talked to co-composers who've worked on a single project or something like that and and in you know uh, james you always mentioned that you all have your strengths and everyone has their strengths and weaknesses in the team so i'm curious how a project kind of starts with all of you and what is that process all the way towards the end we usually, um, well, we kind of each take, we because we're doing six shows right now at once, and it's, uh, it gets a little overwhelming to, and the brain, um, you know, the brain, brain wise, it gets a little overwhelming. So we each kind of try yeah. to take on the head. No, I don't mean the head writer, I mean the head of like overseeing the project for each series. For example, with Pop Troll, I'm usually the guy who gets the music, and I tell these guys, I ask these guys, can you write the villain cue for this? Can you do this? And we kind of divide it up amongst ourselves, and we're always on. Okay. I think we use Skype and we just send each other stuff constantly. And um, so you can hear, uh, you know, I have the queue right before you. So mine needs to go into your queue. And, uh, and, and that's basically it. We send it to each other and we all kind of build each other's, put each other's music in the session and try to bridge the gaps. And it gives you a better overall picture. And I think that, you know, sometimes the, like if the templates sound a little different uh, from a villain to a hero, it gives a nice little, I don't know, separation. So I immediately know where you are in like in the, uh, in the series. How do you how do you guys determine like if a project comes up and be like, oh, this really interests me, I'll take head on this, or like, or how do you decide who's going to be you know, kind of lead? <laughs> if you're if you're the point man on it, like if you're the person who's you know, like like we say, like not really in charge. It's just that somebody needs yeah. to have a full mind towards who's right for this scene, who, how long should, you know, how much writing, we divvied it up evenly. So some person just 
devote some brain power to that. <laughs> Breaks yeah. it all down. Usually I'll be like, oh, James would be amazing at this. Or I, you know, they're spoofing something like Star Wars and I know he's got these the actual scenes memorized, you know, and I know he'd do like, he'd do a great job at that. So, you know, I'm going to assign that cue as much as I would like it. I'm, you know, I, I'm going to assign that cue to James because I know that he's going to, he's going to knock that out of the park sort of thing. And we all have our, uh, like we said, we all have our strengths or our interests that would make us right for a particular cue. Um, like I know Brian uh, collects 80s power ballads. So I give a lot of 80s power ballads to Brian. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's sort of thing. He's good show. too. He's a regular yeah, Kenny Loggins, man. That's awesome. For real. Someone has to be. <laughs> you can make the gourmet version. I know it. So, you know, whoever divvies up, uh, whoever divvies up the scenes is the person who sends it out with the due date. And um, everybody, you know, has to kind of live or die by the due date. Yeah. You know, nobody, you know, uh, nobody can be late ever. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, they send everything back to the point person, whoever the point person is on that gig. Uh, they assemble it all and ship it off. Uh, and then they are also typically the person who will take the revision notes and be like, that's yours, that's yours, that's yours. Break it down. And then, uh, you know, again, same sort of thing. Give a due date. Uh, everybody's revs need to be in by this time. Give it to the person who assembles it and sends it off. And, you know, like we say, it's different for every show because we want to make sure not... Uh, one single person is overwhelmed with all of the different scheduling information. Sure. And, um, you know, job. one of our support staff members, their one of their main jobs is to not only re like uh, record the uh, the singers that come in and you know do the tuning and editing of the best takes of all that stuff, but one of their main jobs is to uh, supervise uh, songs and revision numbers of songs and go back and forth with the client to figure out what still needs to be done and organize those revisions for us. So you know, even though they're they are you know technically are an employee, they're still giving out due dates you know to yeah. us. Because it's more of a roundtable situation than that, you know, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So uh, once in a while, like, uh, you know, maybe once every couple of months, we get the opportunity for all three of us to work on the same piece of music. It's yeah. pretty rare when it happens. Usually we're composing individually because we just have so many shows and so much ground to cover. But it's yeah. really fun when it happens. And I shouldn't be surprised, but every single time I am, I'm like, oh, my God, this sounds great. Uh, like, I can't tell you how many times I've been working on a piece and sent it to Brian and Graham and they sent me parts back and everything's perfect. I don't have to change anything. I just throw it in the mix and it's like absolutely perfect. Uh, and I'm constantly shocked, but I shouldn't be because we've been working together for 22 years. So yeah, like, of course, yeah, as you said, you're, perfect. you're finishing your musical sentences. So yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but that's always fun when we get to do that because for, uh, it, it takes a little bit of the pressure off uh, like our, our individual shoulders. And it's right. kind of nice just to be able to worry about one aspect of the piece and mm -hmm. know that, oh, Brian's going to cover the drums and the guitars yeah. and whatever, and Graham's going to cover this other stuff. And I just get to kind of have the fun of like putting it all together or whatever. Uh, and plus, it's fun to write music with these guys. Like uh, I'm in Seattle, typically working by myself in my studio for like 15 years. I've been out here now. And uh, so it's nice to be able to, uh, you know, collaborate with my friends and business partners and do something creative with other musicians and stuff too. So we still do yeah. do that, so. Yeah. I'd say it's also part of the secret sauce of how we get a very large ask done in a small time. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. when someone asks us for something that sounds near suicidal for a single composer, we will, <laughs> we will do the team up sort of yeah. thing. Yeah as a solution for um, for time management for each of us individually, you know, that, and it's, and it's nice too, because, you know, we've, we're all producers, we're all writers. So, um, you know, us recording a song shell or, or something, you know, in one of our studios and sending out a session to the other guys, you know, like we've been writing together so long, we don't necessarily need to like tell everybody, anybody else what needs to be there. It's, I know their instincts are going to guide them. They know they're on specific instruments or a, a particular task. And um, and yeah, it's it's really helpful. And it's fun, we kind of think of it as like a musical chain letter, you know, one person starts it, yeah. passes it on, he keeps going. I call it musical Voltron, really. Yeah, <laughs> the team up. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> it is fun, fun to back at the end. Especially yeah, if you're the one, you know, when the guy who starts it off is typically uh, the blocker, you know, and it's just basically yeah, yeah, yeah. it out on a piano or a, some kind of like a all orchestra patch, you just kind of, Bring it out. If it's a song, you'll sing a temp vocal and then send it off and then you get it back at the end to mix it. And you're like, oh, this 
Yeah. That's amazing. It's yeah. really gratifying when you sent out a song shell and it was just a sketch. Yeah. And then it comes back feeling super produced. Like there's like a, a euphoric gratification to that when it all works. <laughs> you yeah, know, totally. like uh, being able to put the faders up and you're like, oh, it was it feels finished or something. It feels close. <laughs> I'm, cu I'm curious when you guys are, so when you're working on a piece, it seems like it kind of really becomes cohesive of all of your efforts. But if you're kind of, uh, passing off like oh you're going to do this and this and this what is kind of the strategy to make sure it's a kind of a cohesive sound if it's like for a certain show or you know to make sure that it all sounds the same or do you kind of embrace each other's individual voices a little bit more and i know yeah, Brian, I you're was... saying how you can juxtapose like a villain theme and a hero theme can be very different and that can work for the benefit but i'm curious overall it should have you know do you create an overall sound palette or decide on the beginning like hey guys we're going to go with this sound palette for this show and then everyone just you, know, you just all click <laughs> I was going to point this out earlier, actually, was that one one key thing that's important for us is we all share similar libraries or almost identical libraries on okay. the whole. So mm -hmm. uh, once uh, we've established the sound for a new show, like when we're working on it, uh, it's pretty easy for us to just kind of pick up like, oh, it's pluck strings and this and music boxes and or, or whatever it is, guitars and whatever. Yeah, so then we just load up our palettes kind of match. And mm. I'd say, uh, like, when we were working on Lucas the Spider, for example, Brian uh, nailed the pitch for that. And just, he actually sent me his Pro Tools session with all of the sounds loaded up. So, like, I didn't even have to do anything. I had all of his exact palette that he was using uh, and a really clear guide, uh, like a map of exactly how to hit each scene and how to score it. So I think we nailed that one pretty quickly, actually. It was a smaller palette, for sure. Yeah, that one. And the, yeah. And that's that's basically a cherry palettes and if, if short of that just a list of like you know cine samples brass uh trombone you know you get pretty pretty specific in which patches to uh to use and how to mix yeah them. i mean patches aside writing together for so long like we're saying we're kind of growing this musical hive mind so we're similar yeah. enough but the ways in which we differ i feel are like not necessarily production differences they're like a little bit of musical vocabulary differences that that um i think lend interest to it i think you, you, because there's there is enough of a a different musical voice in different scenes that it, it feels like there's variation or it adds to the sense of variation the type of cues you might hear in a show i think a lot of the 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 initial questions about that stuff get answered in the pilot you know reworking the pilot with a bunch of revisions or, or episode one to four really you answer a lot of those palette questions and cover a lot of the ground you're going to cover for the series and you based on you know what gets accepted and what you've been made to revise a bunch of times uh you kind of know what's working and what isn't working like oh here's how they frame comedy or here's how they like to express danger but not too dangerous because it's for preschoolers you know that sort of thing like you find you find the line um in those first few episodes and i think um sometimes you realize oh james has the answer oh brian has the answer he cracked what comedy is supposed to look like or in this in this world or he you know we he really cracked the code of uh, what action is supposed to look like in this world and and once you do that for a few episodes then it becomes a little more uh, I hesitate to say paint by number but you know things become more obvious on how some of it kind of writes itself doesn't it like that's well, the once thing you once you figure out the code yeah once once you're on episode 50 you know you're not reinventing the wheel you're just yeah, right you're climbing things out differently you know you don't have a cue in the library so far that plays out with this series of emotions, you know, so you have to repaint the picture for this particular scene. But a lot of the time, I think, uh, yeah, once you've, once you've done a bunch of episodes, you've answered a lot of those questions. The how to becomes mm. simple because we've all, we've all seen the first few episodes. We all know what the, the answer book looks like and, mm -hmm. you know, you just need to make more at that point. So, and, and you guys also, I mean, uh, besides just scoring and underscore you also work on a lot of amazing songs i mean you're, you're creating content for uh for preschoolers that are you know developing minds and everything so i'm curious what the songwriting process is uh for the shows that you work on and uh are you all writing melodies and lyrics or is it uh show writers are also working with you on those uh, kind of what is the process for that that's a good question yeah um, they, it's um yeah it's, it's different for every series and, and um a show like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, we uh, they give us some awesome references. They'll go like, you know, Bon Jovi for this one, and like for a preschool show aimed at four year olds, there's some 
Uh, Eye of know, the Tiger was one of my favorite references. Had Rick Astley last year. That was first. Oh, nice. In six, Rick Astley came and uh, is a reference. So and just to clarify, these are these are these are uh, places to yeah. narrow the scope, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not, not yeah. We're, we're going to do something like those songs. We're going to do something that's in the spirit of of these songs that are, yes. um, you know, a lot of the time that might give you a good inclination of what your instrumentation palette should be or the type of, or the tempo that you might want to write it at or that sort of thing. And obviously we're writing uh, uh, like preschool messages. So we're never going to get too clear, too close to Bon Jovi. Right. <laughs> that I mean, was actually that. something that we asked the producers for pretty early on because we found maybe we weren't quite nailing exactly what they had in their heads. Uh, and so we just asked them for a bit more information up front. And as soon as we did, we started getting a one sheet every week for each song that had a musical reference. Uh, they they actually write the hook of the chorus ahead of time, okay. just the yeah. lyrics. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, and then they and then we actually asked them for like just lyrical examples, just something off the top of their head to get us started. And we found once we started getting that direction from them, songs were getting approved like left, right, and center. It totally changed the game. So just a nice little tip for any young composers out there that do a lot of songwriting. Uh, just getting that information out of your director or producer, it was like a game changer. It was a good exercise too, uh, I think, uh, because, you know, when you're asking uh, the people who are asking you to write the song, like to, to narrow their scope and be like, what is the song supposed to be about in one sentence you know like what are yeah, what are yeah. the what are the educational things that you want us to underline for sure you know uh because there are so many different even if you choose a theme there are so many ways you could you could go with a single theme like friendship you know um or or um valuing the time you spend with your relatives or something like that you know there's so many ways you could take that song so uh having them narrow the scope on in a little tiny brief in a really small space uh helps you kind of like uh, it gives you like that kind of like song concentrate you need to like build with or something. It also bridges the gap uh, like in communication between us musicians and the folks on the production side that don't speak music ease, right? right? Uh, yep. So um, it, it just helps make things clear and helps guide them in their direction and just make our lives easier and stuff like that. But uh, as far as Daniel Tiger is concerned too, we actually write, you know, when we're doing the songs, we, we're given the, the hook lyrics, but then we have to write three hook demos of just the hook uh, that wow. then one of, one of those gets approved and then that hook goes to all three of us. So right off the bat, we, ha we have our chorus written ba basically. Mm -hmm. So it's kind yeah. of the hard part actually, coming up with an awesome hook. Um, mm -hmm. And then we sort of translate that. There's four songs per episode. So we split it up. One of us will take two. Uh, and then we basically just uh, write the songs in that style, put our hook in based on that Rick Astley or whatever it was, Kenny Loggins or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then we do a week of revisions while we're actually writing the next series of hooks. So it's kind of like a leapfrog production schedule. And this goes on for, I don't know, maybe six months each season. Yeah. Uh, we write about... Wait, how many songs is it per season? Like 80 songs or something like that? 80. 80. 80, wow. on, a, 80 on a typical a season. Our first, the first season was over, it was 160. Over, right. probably closer to 200 when you add all that. Wow. Over. But there's been a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot yeah. of songs. It's That's a where lot. the musical references come in because you just want to yeah. start, you just want to hear something and be inspired and be like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And it gets, it reignites your... Um, you know, inspiration. And all of music is like an ongoing conversation of like, you're kind of like, these are the people that influenced me. I'd love to do something like that. You know, yeah. your own take on that is never what that is. It's some, it's you putting your own spin on and adding your own musical voice to that tradition or of making tracks in the style. And I feel like all of, all of music is this ongoing conversation of, <laughs> of, uh, of artists kind of um, taking whatever it is that they love and trying to do something like those those references that they fell in love with, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, it's no, no different. It's just kind of on a schedule, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, um, I, and also just, I'm curious of just like the, your audience, you know, your audience, you know, are gonna be younger, uh, younger uh, children. And, you know, you have awesome songs like Do the Pup Slide. And, you know, you wrote, I, you wrote, I think you guys wrote a song during COVID about washing hands and like, you're also teaching like lessons as well. So of course, 
uh, child psychology kind of comes into it. You know, I'm, we're as a studio at Cartoon Network, we're starting to get into preschool space a little bit too. We uh, mm -hmm. mostly we're doing kind of TV PG TV 14, but you know, you know, mm -hmm. Disney I think really has it down and Paramount as well. And so I'm curious, uh, having to write songs that kind of send a message, but also kind of work with a developing mind. Is that part? Do you keep that in the back of your mind when you're writing these things and putting them together? Yeah, you know, the, the production companies do a great job of telling us where we're landing on this because, mm. uh, you know, uh, out of the blue, nice story, brown bag, for FRC, Fred for, for Rogers Company, that is. I mean, they're doing uh, active testing on the material that we're, uh, that we're putting right. forward. So, the, you know, and um, Angela Santamaro comes from a child psychology background. She's one of the makers of Blue Clues before Daniel and all of that. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, she's... She has a background in uh, in child psychology, and like I say, they do all this testing. They think very hard about what's graspable and what's uh, usable to um, you know the the minds of kids at very specific age groups. So yeah, yeah. I think that, say again, sorry, Brian. So I was just saying they'll go into classrooms and daycares to test exactly, play music and they'll for read people. they'll read the scripts and play early versions of our song submissions, and they might say something like, "Oh, you know, in that imagination song where." The, you know, you sat, you actually sang the words broom and broom, broom, beep, beep, that sort of thing. They really responded to the, the making the car noises. Let's add a few more of those in there, you know, that sort of thing. Like they're going to see what's engaging kids or, um, or, or what really grabbed them and try and build on that sort of thing. And I think we're um, also what might potentially confuse kids too. I feel like, yeah, that. so we're on, we've done, we just finished or wrapped up on season six of Daniel. And I feel like uh, I've learned, we've all learned so much basically uh, from our song, like writing the lyrics to the songs. Like I've learned the type of language that preschool children respond to. So like you can't have things that are too complex. You can't yeah. have concepts that are too abstract. Uh, and so sure. by now, actually, I feel like we have a, a good instinct as to what will work really well with preschool children. And the other thing is we all three of us have the best school you can possibly have where we're all parents ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we've got kids at home and they're, we're testing some of these songs on them to see like how it bounces off them and stuff like that. But I, I think over the last eight years or however long we've been working on Daniel. Wait, is it a decade now? It's been a while. I feel like we years. really, it, it was like a crash course in early childhood education for us. And I feel like now we, we're completely armed with all of the, the type of tools we'd need to write music for that age demographic, just from working on it. One important point too, uh, because we don't want to ignore the parents because the parents have That's the ability it. to change the channel. So and yep. it's easy to write a really annoying kid song. So we have been trying to make it sound good and cool. Baby like, shark, do, do. Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it is an amazing song, and I'm very, it's done it very well. But yeah, we try to make songs that the parents will actually listen to and be like, "Oh, that's not bad." <laughs> yeah. From from the They're feedback the I've gotten, we've been successful in that department as well. Uh, like a lot of parents have told me, like, "Oh, I love that disco song," or "I love this thing," or whatever, and they bop their head to it. And, really enjoy it. So Brian, Brian's totally on to something there for sure. That's also where it comes all the, the reference and the inspirations because those are the artists that we all or you all grew up with and the parents yeah. grew up with. So if you're doing a John Bon Jovi or something like that or Rick Astley, you know, the parents were like, oh, I understand the, the style that's kind of in, you know, if you represent yeah, the style or, or evolve yeah. a yeah. style. <laughs> we haven't had Nirvana yet. I'm waiting for Nirvana to show up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nine Inch Nails, no Nine Inch yeah. Nails yet. Or... <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm waiting for the day I'm that's like, be like season 10 when they're really desperate they're like we've visited every style or well once the if, you just, if the show keeps going the kids will grow up with the show by the time they're you know a certain age you guys can throw in those right <laughs> yeah. yeah so oh, over your, your time together i mean the two plus decades you've been working on on stuff is there a project that really kind of stands out to all three of you or separately what's kind of something that really resonated with you personally that you really look back on oh that was a lot of fun I love working on that one or is there maybe a specific song or maybe even a character or something that really just kind of pops in your mind is like oh that was that was a, a lot of fun to work and it was really rewarding is there anything I mean we can go down the line we can start with Brian you know is there anything from Ooh, don't start with me I'm thinking hard okay. I, I have a good one I have all right James one, jump actually. in then so yeah so I mean like as far as personally rewarding, I'd say like Daniel Tiger, just as far as, you know, uh, we get to help kids and families. We're invited into uh, families' homes every day 
and yeah. we're helping teach uh, kids lessons that are they're going to carry with them for the rest of their life. So that's very personally rewarding. But I would have to say the show that like I personally, I mean, it may, maybe it's not the most fun I've ever had, but it's up there. Uh, it was a show we did many years ago called Meta Jets, and it was an anime about transforming jet fighters. And everything was like basically it was like a riff on Star Wars. Like it was like a farm That's your boy, bread and butter. <laughs> right? It was like a farm boy who gets like pulled into this larger world and there's huge every episode had like a huge battle and every episode I remember I was like frothing at the mouth to start like I I don't remember being so excited to work on a show and then the irony is uh basically I think it aired once at like two o'clock in the morning on Cartoon Network and then was shelved. Like I don't even I think you can find some episodes on YouTube. So it also is sort of combined with a little bit of heartbreak. But I mean, as we were yeah. talking about earlier, that's part of the journey and everything. But so for me, that was like, I just had a blast working on that one. It was just super fun. It primed us for Bakugan though. Exactly. Okay. There you go. Yeah, exactly. It was a orchestra boot camp, that show. It really was. <laughs> It was yeah. such an important stepping stone, like even though it, it basically was shelved, like I couldn't imagine where we'd be without having worked on it. So absolutely. I, I learned so much about orchestral writing, just needing to write that much on that show <laughs> that quickly. Right. So, yeah, I mean, for, for me, I think uh, I would echo everything that James said about uh, Daniel Tiger, just growing up from watching um, Fred Rogers when I was a kid to watching yeah. my own daughter listen to my own songs on the show <laughs> and whatnot Man. and her using this stuff like I think she used the strategy for keep trying you'll get better like for like two months wow. daily I use that strategy <laughs> just yesterday oh, yeah, I use that strategy yeah totally it's so rewarding to, to see like as a parent you're not it's like your work is not blending into your as a life as a parent and that's like that must be amazing that would I mean. be, honestly it's been so cool to watch her uh you know boot up with that as her os <laughs> you know like yeah. it's uh it's been kind of in it's been kind of amazing to uh to experience it firsthand because as a composer you don't get to see people enjoying your work most of the time you know yeah um so to to see her lost in it, it's really beautiful um but i you know one of the things for me i think um and maybe it's because it's it's kind of towards some of my own interests was uh some of the nat geo documentary work that we got to do um, yeah. A long time ago, I thought that was really fun and really interesting. It allowed us to work with a lot of uh, cool live players too, which um, you know, just uh, to be able to depict certain parts of the world and whatnot in a filmic way. Um, so yeah, it was really neat. It was a cool experience, and um, interesting stories were being told. Kind of min like um, small mysteries were being solved by geologists and stuff, and cool animations and. And, and it was speaking to my own demographic too and my own interests. So yeah. it was really neat to score some of that stuff. And I felt like also it was a real palate cleanser from all of the uh, cartoon work that we do. So I think that's part of the other sure. reason where it felt special or something. Absolutely. I'm going to go at, for my show, I'm going to go the obvious choice. I'm going to go Paw Patrol uh, because it was, a, for me, it was a magical time. We had done other work with these guys and we had done another show that had uh, puppies driving cars. And- uh, True. So we turbo got, dogs, um, turbo you know, dogs. Yeah, exactly. And one of our favorite uh, directors who we'd worked with before asked us to, uh, he didn't even ask us to demo on it, which is crazy because it's obviously such a huge show. But back then it was just a little, little show about puppies. And, yeah. um, and my son was two when it aired and when it debuted. Uh, so I had, uh, you know, I, I remember the magic of watching it become uh, what it's become uh, throughout him. Like I remember taking him, when he was five to his first Paw Patrol birthday party. And uh, it was themed, like I didn't know. I showed up and there was all this Paw Patrol stuff around. I hadn't, I didn't even know they had this like, you know, yeah. parties and all that. And I told the dad, I was like, oh, I read the music for this show. He's like, what? It's his favorite show. See, yeah. Brian, and, you actually got to live your dream and be a rock star. Exactly. So there exactly. You go. <laughs> now they've both outgrown it. But um, it was a very magical time to see this uh, little show that, uh, you know, had great potential and was, embraced as a uh, part of the yeah social fabric and nowadays you know yeah. like uh yeah so yeah and that's working with them was a complete pleasure from start to finish we had done i mean you guys you guys got to yeah it was, i think it's unique because you all said your favorite things but you were all part of the same journey together so it's like absolutely that you all went on the same journeys it's i, I which i find so i mean yes. inspiring 
Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, to, to wrap things up, I, I, I want to bring up the topic because, uh, you know, it seems like just last year where everyone was really all in on animation and Netflix was building up their animation team. And we're, you know, as a studio, Warner Brothers going into preschool. But, you know, you know, recently we have all these mergers now that's happening and, you know, Netflix got hit really bad. And, you know, it's I'm not going to lie. It's been a really tough week with Cartoon Network and what's up, what's going on right now. But um, some, you know, as animation is kind of. Uh, getting hit a lot recently, taking big hits, and uh, from you know the people at top are making these decisions. I'm just, I just want to go around and, and take you know why is it so important to you, and why do you think we need to really keep up what what we all do for a living and and keep animation in in the world for early developing minds and and also for just I mean animation is for everyone. It goes from preschool all the way to adulthood. It depends, you know. So I'm just curious, why is animation important? And you know, one of the things that I find so beautiful about animation is that it's uh, it's it's this massive artistic effort that is uh, happening on behalf of so many people in so many different kinds of arts, right? There's people who are on the technology side of making animation happen. There's an army of people uh, sketching things. There's a, you know, there's uh, people like us on the music side, but you know, you look at the end credits of any animated show and there's an army of people involved, an army yeah. of creative people working together for a project that nobody could do individually. Yep. And um, you know, from all the acting performances to uh, the, the, uh, the drawn choreography to uh, all of the different, um, yeah, to the, the writers who are doing the dialogue, to the composers, everybody. There's so many different types of uh, creative minds working together for a common goal. And, um, you know, you see that in other places like uh, video games and such, you know, it takes an army to make a, a product like that as well, if you look at the credits. Um, but mm -hmm. animation is one of those special places where I feel like, you know, you're you're also uh, expressing uh, a, a fun story or an idea from start to finish in a linear fashion too. And I think yeah, yeah. You know, that narrative storytelling is something that we're, you know, we're all connected to as human beings, but, um, you know, drawing stuff out of our imagination, making an imagined world come to life for people in a group effort, I think is something that's pretty artistically special. It's part of the reason, like, I love being, a piece of the machinery of any one of these shows, but I'm just a yeah. piece, right? And and I like being a part of that big machinery. I don't want to. I uh, it gives me something different than when I'm working on my own personal projects. You know, absolutely. That's so I like a, being part of that. That's a great way to put it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sir. Yeah, James, Ryan, do you have any? Uh, what are your kind of takes on? Well, yeah, I, I think animation for well, I think uh, we're fortunate enough to work on shows like Daniel Tiger, where there's an emphasis on education. So yeah. I would say pretty clearly there, it's it's nice to be uh, involved in something that helps people and that can help educate. And animation, especially shows like Daniel Tiger, but there's there's a whole bunch of shows on PBS, right, that yes, are all yeah. educational and just very positive. And not to sound cheesy or whatever, but I feel like the, after the last two years, I feel like we're living in some sort of post-apocalyptic world. Like things, yeah, things have yeah. not been fantastic for a lot of people. And all of these shows add a nice slice of positivity into people's lives. And I think that that's become even more important now than it even used to be, especially these lessons about kindness and thinking about others and empathy and all of that. So I think, um, I think from that aspect, it's really important. And then also animation, kind of echoing what Graham was saying, it's a, an avenue to maybe tell stories that you can't tell in live action, or you can't tell in literature. And I'm thinking about movies like Turning Red, which was just such a unique uh, story being told, a unique setting, like, uh, and it's just a really special story. And a lot of the Pixar stuff is kind of like that. Like the, the I, I'm gonna forget the name, the one about the emotions. Uh, Inside Out. Inside yes. Out. It's yeah. just a very specific idea. Like, I don't think that would translate to live action. So um, in this day and age, we're able to tell all of these kind of incredible imaginative stories that we didn't used to be able to tell as often. So anyways, that's sort of that's sort of my take on the importance of animation. Absolutely. Brian, how about yourself? Exactly that's, that's exactly the point I was going to say, is the, um, allowing Me? you to tell stories that blow Brain the imagination. Sink. Yeah, yeah it's true. And, if, and from my point of view, it's just that I think at least for television animation is kind of the last like playground that 2d animation really can survive like where oh. you know you know we were what we do at cartoon works studios i am blown away by our background 
artists and our character designers and and our you know you know our storyboard artists i mean it's just like it's all by hand it's all you know yeah. we we're, we're still have that personal touch that per, you know where you know and i love cgi animation too you know it's it's fantastic and it's and they both have a place but you know i feel like 2d animation is was really quickly to put to the side like no that's really for kid kids and it's not meant for the big screen or narratives of big, you know, feature films and stuff like that. But for me, you know, the first film I ever watched as a human being that my mom showed me was Fantasia. And that was like, well, yeah. on, I think <laughs> really changed the, the chemistry of my brain or something like oh, just yeah. images and music and no dialogue. And, you know, I don't know, but it's like, I think it's, you know, I grew up with Lamp Before Time and all these things that were just like, just left a lasting imprint on me, you know, five old, you know, American tale, all these, you know, Don Bluth is my, is my boy. I love Don Bluth. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're a kid, you know, like those yeah. places watching movies over and over again, like kids often do, or we, like we probably all did when we were kids. Yeah. I feel like they almost become like escape hatches, like, yeah. like a place of comfort <laughs> that you return back to or something when you rewatch them. And, you know, um, I think those are important for kids too, to have these like little, uh, almost like, uh, it's like a break that's just for them, an episode that they've seen a million times that they want to watch again, because it's yeah. like it's almost like this place of mental comfort for them to to go back there. And I think a lot of us rewatch shows for that reason, and yep. and I think kids do it too, you know, with, with their can, favorite animated shows or favorite episodes. Can put you in a comfortable Absolutely. spot. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. gentlemen, I think that's a, a wonderful uh, point to, to 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 come to a conclusion. And you guys have been amazing. Thank you, Graham, James, Brian, for all of your insight and for thank sharing so everything about your stories. And 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 uh, I want to thank also Impact Twenty Four PR for helping put together this amazing panel. And you know, we have a bunch of great other videos at filmmusicmedia.com um, from Film Music Media's uh, Midsummer Music Matinee series. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So Appreciate it.